down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me around among the bones, and I saw that there were many bones in the valley, and that they were very dry. And then he asked me, human, can these bones live? I answered, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophecy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to the bones. I will cause breath to enter you so you will come to life. I will put muscles on you and flesh on you and cover you with skin. And then I will put breath in you so you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was coming to And while I prophesied, there was a noise and a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and saw muscles come on the bones, and flesh grew, and skin covered the bones, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, Prophecy to the wind. Prophecy, human, and say to the wind, This is what the Lord God says. Wind, come from the four winds and breathe on these people who were killed so they can come back to life. So I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a very large army. And then he said to me, Human, these bones are like all the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope has gone. We are destroyed. So prophecy and say to them, This is what the Lord God says. My people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. And then I will bring you into the land of Israel. My people, you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and cause you to come up from them. And I will put my spirit inside you and you will come to life. And then I will put you in your own land and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, says the Lord. And then if you would please join me, um, we're going to do a unison reading of Psalm 130, and that's on page 848 in the United States. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, Lord hear my Lord. voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark inequities, O Lord, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord, where my soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the Lord is Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. And then the second reading is in the New Testament. It's Romans um, 37. And it is verses, I'm sorry, Romans 8. And then we'll just a second. Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. If people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there is death. But if their thinking is controlled by the spirit, there is life and peace. When people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, they are against God, because they refuse to obey God's law, and really are not even able to obey God's law. Those people who are ruled by their sinful selves cannot please God. But you are not ruled by your sinful selves. You are ruled by the Spirit, if that Spirit of God really lives in you. But the person who does not have the Spirit of God does not belong to Christ. Your body will always be dead because of sin. But if Christ is in you, then the Spirit gives you life, because Christ made you right with God. God raised Jesus from the dead, and if God's Spirit is living in you, he will also give life to your bodies that die. God is the one who raised Christ from the dead, and he will give life through his spirit that lives in you. The response is a sun response on page 393, Spirit of the Living God.
John. And following that, our response will be the Apostles' Creed. You can find that at 881 in the hymnal. <coughs> this passage is about the death of Lazarus <coughs> and the rising from death of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message, a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how we loved him? But some of them said, 
Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Here is the reading of God's word for us this day. We do not expect dead people to come to life. As Christians, we believe, as did Martha, that the dead will rise again in the resurrection. It's a body thing. First we die, then we are raised to new life, to live in heaven with God. But we do not expect that to happen today, and probably not even our tomorrow. Still, it is our belief in the resurrection, God's victory over the power of death that makes us distinctive as Christians. As Christians, we have hope and we see life where others find only defeat and death. We know that God's resurrection is already being brought about today. We don't have to wait until we are taken up into heaven to have new life. The call to Lazarus is to come forth now, today, to leave our tombs behind and to live. Jesus Christ calls us forth to no lesser a destiny in this age and in the age to come, to leave our death in all of its ways behind. A small congregation in a community near a much larger city was slowly, steadily losing its members. It had once been a viable, self-supporting church with its own full-time pastor and over 300 active members. But by 1998, However, it was served only by a part-time pastor. And when the weather was poor, perhaps half a dozen people all over the age of 70 gathered for Sunday worship. There had not been a Sunday school or a confirmation class for well over a decade. And the youth quit meeting as a group long even before that. The congregation had learned to make good use of its building, offering it up to the community to use it as they had need for support groups, for potlucks and fundraiser gatherings. But in many ways, the building was a huge problem. It was slowly falling apart. <clears throat> One day, a longtime member went to the pastor with a simple observation. We are using all of our resources to take care of ourselves. That is not right. And this congregation needs to close. 
In total agreement, but stunned by the members' boldness, the pastor promised to find out what steps would need to be taken. She contacted a local denominational staff member who came out to meet with the few remaining members. Slowly, over the course of a half a year, decisions were made. They would indeed close. Their last Sunday would be on Pentecost Sunday in June. The building would be sold to a nearby Christian college that needed land for expansion. The pews and the altar and the pulpit and all the other furnishings would be given to a rural church that had suffered a major fire the year before. Money from a small endowment and from the sale of the property would be split. Half would be given to a fund to support new church starts in the area. And half would be given to a seminary in India where one of their former pastors was now a professor. The congregation would die. But from that death, new life would be given to at least four communities. The resources that were inadequate to support a single congregation were more than enough to make a huge difference in the future ministries of two schools and untold members of numbers of congregations. As Christians, we have hope and we see life where others find only defeat and death. We know that God's resurrection is already being brought about today. We are called to come forth from the tomb and live. Four college friends plan to spend their spring break in southern Alabama, not sunbathing on the beach of the Gulf of Mexico, but helping members of a congregation refurbish an abandoned convenience store. Repaired, clean, brought up to code, the building would become a church-run daycare center. The parents of these college kids were pleased with the group's plan. What parent would not be grateful to see a child demonstrate such maturity and selflessness? Midterm exams would end on Friday, and the students had be decided to begin their 20-hour drive after that. They started out in high spirits, relieved that the exams were over and ready for a break from a long, cold, snowy, cloudy, miserable winter. We know all about that. Some place in southern Illinois, though, the driver fell asleep. And you can probably guess the rest. The car veered off the road, flipped several times, and rolled down an embankment. A farmer driving home from a Friday night game with friends came upon the car and raced back home to his home to call for rescue vehicles. By the time it was all over, though, all four of the students died. It was too late to do anything for the students. <coughs> but it was not too late for them to make a difference. Family members were contacted. Funerals were conducted. A memorial service was held at the students' college on the first day after classes resumed. And from the proceeds of life insurance policies the students' families held, a scholarship was established to benefit a needy student from the Alabama community where the students had been headed. As Christians, we have hope. 
and we see life where others only find defeat and death. We know that God's resurrection is already being brought about today. We are called to come forth from the tomb. My brother Duke and his wife Chris were months away from his retirement from Procter & Gamble. They had plans to build their retirement home in Michigan on a lake where they had vacationed for years. At a company meeting one morning in October 2006, Duke complained of a severe headache and moments later he collapsed. The doctor said he had a brain aneurysm that would be hard to recover from. A week later, he had another and was pronounced brain dead. Chris and their daughters prayed and prayed to God for guidance, for help and what to do. With great peace in their heart, they decided to remove him from life support, <coughs> but not before they harvested over 60 organs and tissues. For months following his death, letters came in from recipients. of Duke's life-giving donation. One lady wrote that she had named the kidney she had received Beautiful Blessing. As Christians, we have hope and we see life where others only find defeat and death. We know that God's resurrection is already being brought about today. We are called to come forth from the tomb. Friends, where do you see defeat and death in your life? What new life is God waiting to bring about there? Defeat comes in long-held anger, resentment, bitterness. New life comes in forgiveness, letting go, moving on. Death comes in incurable physical illness. New life comes in healing the spirit. Defeat comes in the loss of a well-loved job. New life comes in skills shared in another creative arena of life. Death comes in the loss of a spouse or a child. New life comes the day it feels good to laugh again. The movement to new life it's not easy. Martha and Mary and their friends, even Jesus wept. Lazarus had begun to decay and stink. But the good news for us as Christians is Jesus' cry, Lazarus, come out, and his command, unbind him and let him go. Come out, come forth from the tomb, friends, and live.